Jeffrey Dudgeon, MBE, is an author, historian, convener of the Malone House Group and gay rights activist. Jeff took a case to the European Court of Human Rights in 1976, Dudgeon v. United Kingdom, on the grounds that his private life as a gay man was being denied in breach of Article 8 of the Convention on Human Rights. Jeff won his case eventually in 1981. The next year, the Homosexual Offences Order in 1982 brought the law in Northern Ireland into line with that in England and Wales. Scotland decriminalised in 1980. His case was the key precedent used in the Norris v. Ireland application lodged with the European Court at Strasbourg in 1983. And before we get started, just want to let some of the people watching know that we will be talking about sexual abuse of minors in the course of our discussion here. So if anybody feels that that's an issue that they're uncomfortable with, you might want to maybe just kind of switch off for a little while, come back to us in about you know five or ten minutes uh, when we'll have continued on with the conversation. Okay, so let me just set the background for this. The Kinkora uh, Boys Home was a care facility for working boys in Belfast, Northern Ireland. In January 1980, reports started to emerge of sexual abuse of the boys by staff in the home, three of whom were uh, convicted and jailed. A shocking story of child sexual abuse was exposed. State cover-up and the uh, destruction of the lives of the boys. Later, a witch hunt ensued uh, of care workers who identified as gay or bisexual or who might be seeking uh, such employment. Jeff, I'm kind of given a, a, a very quick overview of what the issue around the Concora Boys Home is all about. Could you fill it in a bit more and just kind of explain it better for people? Right, Carl. Uh, as was stated, it was a boys' home. There was a, a, a newspaper, that actually it was the Irish Independent, uh, broke the story that there had been uh, misbehaviour of a serious nature at the home in, I think, 1980. Uh, and it, it, it ballooned, in a sense, from there, because cause quite quickly the police moved in and arrested and convicted uh, the three individuals who were named. Um, and in that sense, the, 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 um, the problem was solved in respect of the immediate problem was solved, but, but the fact remained that there, there had to be an inquiry into why this, this abuse continued over, over a number of years and in other boys' homes, um, um, not just <clears throat> state homes, but also religious homes. Uh, so, in fact, there's been a series of about six inquiries into Kinkora and the whole thing finalised in the uh, Hart, Anthony's, Judge Anthony Hart inquiry, which reported about four years ago uh, after a very lengthy uh, process and uh, published a, a report which is available on the internet if you've got several days it would take to read, read all the chapters. But there's two or three chapters particularly on Kinkora and it, it, it lays out the whole issue and, uh, and what exactly happened. And it also nails a lot of the conspiracy theories uh, evidentially and says that there's nothing, there was no, there was smoke, but there was certainly no fire in, in these areas. I mean, following that, there, there was the um, decision to try and eliminate anybody who identified as gay or bisexual males uh, from working in the care sector. How did that come about? Like, what do, is there any indication as to what the thinking was behind that? Uh, uh, it was prejudice, I think, and fear. Uh, the, the, in, a, in one sense, Kinkora home, there was a political aspect as one of the three guys convicted had connections within unionism. Uh, he was quite prominent in, in certain, slightly eccentric end, but he was very significant in terms of youth, unionist youth, and he was an influential uh, preacher and but also a groomer, probably, of... Uh, young men in, in, in the Unionist uh, Party, quite, quite significant numbers of whom uh, prospered in later life uh, politically. But uh, that that enabled a sort of conspiracy theory to develop and the, the newspapers gradually built up a whole series of uh, assertions about the home and what happened at it. And it got, well, it essentially got out of hand in the sense that it was the home in Belfast was actually about three miles from Stormont, and you know the stories became rampant that, that people thought 
political figures, top military figures, top civil servants, even Lord Mountbatten was, you know, were stopping on the way to Stormont and uh, taking advantage of the of the boys at that home. And essentially, the hard report says not none of this is was true, and it was it stands to reason in a sense if you were uh, misbehaving in a home and abusing the youth. Uh, the last thing you probably want is a whole lot of people trooping in who, who were uh, uh, somewhat superior to you and maybe would take over. So basically it was a, a problem and it turned out that that problem existed in almost all boys' homes in, 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 in England and Wales, and possibly in the south of Ireland, I don't, I'm not too sure. But um, uh, in fact, Northern Ireland cleaned up its boys' homes long before anyone else. So in that sense, we were in, in front of the problem. But it was not done uh, because someone was sensible. It was done because the newspaper exposed it. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, the union got involved, NIPSA got involved. Uh, how did that come about? Like, and and well, what was the aim of NIPSA getting involved? In, uh, in the sort of, uh, you know, the people got increasingly concerned that there was a whole world of... Uh, Pedophilia and conspiracy to abuse children out there, and uh, to to meet that problem, uh, the Eastern Health Board, which is the Belfast Trust, really in charge of the health, adopted a policy of uh, not not just not employing gays in in homes, uh, children's homes, but in any caring role of any sort, and that was a huge significant step because. Considerable number of gay people, uh, uh, gay and lesbian uh, and bisexual, were working in in the public care sector, and that's always been the case, always will be the case. Uh, so that was adopted, and uh, the one voice that stood out against it in in public was uh, Lawrence Pimley, who was a trade union official with Northern Ireland Public Service Alliance, the biggest public sector trade union in Northern Ireland. Uh, and he was courageous and, and spoke out at both at a gay conference in Belfast and, and otherwise, uh, saying that this was uh, unconscionable policy and had to be uh, stopped for good reasons, good trade union reasons. It was his members that were being uh, sacked. And, and some, we discovered that a number of people were then sacked, who were who, who the authorities detected were gay, not because they'd done anything wrong, but simply because they were gay. And then it had also a huge chilling, chill effect that people, I mean, if you were gay and looking a job, well, you wouldn't apply there because you could see the future was going to be bleak, if not unpleasant, to, to say the least. So that, that policy lasted for a couple of years. And with the, the work of Lawrence Finley and Nipsa, uh, and uh, also the one member of the Eastern Health Board, a guy called James Fort Smith, uh, who worked in the Ulster Museum, was an art curator. He stood against the policy. And eventually it went up to the Department of Health at Stormont, which was run at that time. The Prime Secretary was Morris Hayes, a very sensible guy. And he blocked it. Uh, and the policy was abandoned. But I think the damage was largely done. And, and, and for many years, it had a chill factor on, on employment of gay people throughout Northern Ireland. And, and do we know what kind of effect it had on the individuals who had been um, sacked from their jobs? Well, the whole the whole thing it got out of control. It became it became a witch hunt, really. And I know when I met people who, who just lost their jobs and moved to England, I, met, uh, I dealt with two boys actually who were living in a boys' home outside Belfast who were uh, arrested by the police for consensual sexual activity between themselves. <clears throat> the staff were so panicky that anything sexual was put, reported to the police without uh, consideration of uh, the, the reality or the, or, the, or the outcome. So they were actually, having got them a very good solicitor in Belfast, they went into court and literally at the door of the court, they were told the police had, had dropped the case. But it was that atmosphere was particularly nasty and frightening. And I'm just wondering, in terms of um, reacting to what happened um, by, by introducing the policy, do you think that if NIPSA hadn't gotten involved, or sorry, if, if the union movement hadn't gotten involved, that uh, that ban would have been lifted, uh, would not have been lifted, or might have taken much longer for it to be lifted? 
I think that was strategically important that a significant trade union and a very respected leader, he would be number three or something in the union. Uh, unfortunately, Lawrence died in the late 1980s. Um, but without his support, and he was a very vigorous individual who, who you know, people listened to. Uh, and, and I think that was uh, uh, critical support because people like Morris Hayes, who ran the Department of Health, you know, they needed someone to back up their, their new policy of abandoning the, the hateful discrimination policy. It wasn't even discrimination. It was, um, it was simply uh, elimination of gays from significant areas of employment. And I'm just wondering, uh, we live in a different world now uh, to a greater extent. Um, the, the, the protections that exist now in uh, Northern Ireland for workers who identify as LGBT uh, is completely different to what it used to be. Um, like, is it, a, is it a, a happier place to be in terms of being an LGBT worker? Uh, yeah, it's hugely happier. Actually, the Republic was the first who introduced anti-discrimination rules for in employment. That was the moment when they overtook Northern Ireland in a sense. We got decriminalisation first, even and um, my case had to be won for David Norris to win his case eventually in Strasbourg. But the anti-discrimination stuff started and the EU was probably quite significant as well. And that, that was involved. Um, but Yes, and I mean, now we've got gay-friendly policies throughout um, throughout so many employers, and they, they have special events and pride weeks and, and get in internal groups who are uh, key to their policy making and so on. So we've moved from, criminal, uh, from being criminals to being respected members of society. Jeff, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for filling us in on that. Uh, situation um, and as always it's good to see you it's good to see you Carl I'm looking so prosperous <laughs>